out there and welcome back to another episode of my grocery adventure this is episode number five and today i am rejoined by marcy penner of the kansas sampler foundation and her co-director sarah green welcome ladies to the show thanks for having us yeah excited for you to be here we did cover in the last episode with Marcy more about Kansas Sampler Foundation. So we started there, but we're going to dive more into it of what is this organization? What do you do? How do you make an impact in the world? We're going to get into all that good stuff, but we have not met Sarah yet. So if you would be so kind as to tell us a little bit about your background, and then we can get way more into it as we go. Sure. So um, proud Kansan. Grew up in central Kansas, uh, had lived in Hutchinson, Topeka, um, around the state in those places. Um, uh, background in journalism, went to KU. Um, and then when I graduated, all of my friends were moving to Chicago and all these places that had great big newspapers. And I moved to Hutchinson <laughs> and I was so excited about it. Um, and uh, that was um, kind of the start of a path um, in and out of journalism, in and out of state government. I've worked for the Kansas Department of Agriculture, the Kansas Department of Transportation, um, doing a bunch of different types of roles. But um, I was a consultant for a while. Uh, everything um, that I've done has been in Kansas. And I just feel really lucky. Um, to have sort of made this career that has led me to now being a co-director of the Kansas Sampler Foundation. Yeah. My first question is, why do you feel lucky? What about that path is is making you feel lucky? Um, I, I just love, I love Kansas. I love it so much. Um, where I think um, it has been tempting at times to think, I don't know, and I could maybe live somewhere else. I don't really think I can. Uh, there is so much here. There is so much to be discovered. There is so much to be experienced. Um, there are so many amazing people here that um, it just, I don't know, it only makes sense for me to be here. But I think the, the luck is that um, in some ways, I guess I've been able to kind of create my own path. Um, because there's no one to tell me I couldn't. Um, that. And that's the real benefit of living here. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. You seem perfect for this job that you have now. I can see why you're such a good fit. Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. I love that. And so how long have you been with Kansas Sampler Foundation? Like when did you join as co-director? Uh, I started January 1st of this year, so just almost nine months in, okay. but but I've been around for a little while. Tell us about that. What does that, what does that entail? Um, I don't know. I, um, I've i been around as a volunteer. I worked on the second guidebook um, with Marcy and Wendy. Um, I grants, have written some report. grants, helped with the Kansas Power Up and Go report. Um, just kind of hanging out in the background for a while. And how did you come to be into it, to want to volunteer? Of all the things, I mean, it's obviously a worthy cause, but why, why this organization? Um, why not? <laughs> totally, totally. I don't even know the answer to that. Um, so I was thinking about it. I'm pretty sure I first um, emailed Marcy like 21 years ago when I was an intern at the Hutch News and I was, um, there was this like dreaded summer, you know, promotional, like get out and see Kansas and everybody had to kind of like squeeze these stories in about all these, you know, quirky Kansas things. And I was like, this is the best job ever. <laughs> and so um, I was reporting a story and I emailed Marcy um, then, and I don't know, we just kind of stayed in touch. We kept bumping into similar cir our circles, just bumped into each other. And then it's hard to describe what draws a person in or some an organization to a person, but clearly her love of Kansas was so evident. And we started inviting her to the retreat for rural leaders and 
I mean, yeah, she lives in Wichita, Topeka, but she has this, she's a rural aspirationalist, as she says it. And just, you know, sometimes you can be from bigger cities, but have this affection for smaller towns. Mm -hmm. And Sarah always did. And she just fit in with this group of rural leaders and eventually the power up core group. But back to her. I, that's so helpful. Yeah. Like who knows how we get on the paths we get on, right? I love that this has been tw over 20 years in the making. So when you, Marcy, when you conceived of needing a co-director and wanting to do this transition, like, did you have Sarah in mind or was there an application pool or how did that all come to pass? Sarah had just kind of been the captain of the writing of the Kansas Power Up and Go report. And did that come before the transition? It was all around the same time. Yeah. So uh, we put a transition team together of which uh, I'll use the word again. Sarah was the captain of this transition team with four others who knew us pretty well. And um, I don't think she had even had a inkling of a thought that a co-directorship was on the table. So these guys worked on this report, you know, talking to each other, talking to people that knew us. Sarah can explain more. But I want you to know that when that transition report started, she was not thinking in that direction. Is that right? Uh, Marcy had asked me to come on board a few years before, and I said no. She did. She said no. Was it just not the right time or like there was something else that you wanted to be no. doing at that time? Yes, I couldn't see it. She could see it, but I couldn't see it yet. Okay. Okay. And then as the transition report, I mean, was starting to end, I think the thought of being interim director became a little more uh, in, in mind, mm -hmm. interim. Mm -hmm. But that sort of implied that I would be gone, mm -hmm. It wasn't to be the case. So then what happened, Sarah? How did all of a sudden? I think I saw something on the internet that said co-director. And it was like, that's it. Not about us. Not it's about us. Um, no. Out there in the world. The concept. A co-director model is happening a lot more in other places. Um, I think the thing I was looking at was maybe from New England somewhere. Um, just it's a different style of of organizational structure but as soon as I saw the word I was like that's it that's it and I love that the word interim was sort of tossed away because for me co-director meant a little bit had a little more permanence to it I don't think I asked her that for a while because I didn't want to hear her say oh no don't look at it that way but it felt it felt more permanent, but what was it that you started to know us better, which made you feel more inclined to do this? What what was that? What happened that we were, oh, that big grant. Oh, yeah, we did get a grant, which really helped. But she was working on this big grant prior to becoming co-director. And and I think that writing it up, writing, you know, the story of KSF, what was possible, the future, what would happen if we added staff, which the the, the grant was largely about. Did you start to see yourself in that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, so sometimes people ask me what the Kansas Sampler Foundation does, and I've started saying, well, you'll know it when you feel it. This is a very feeling organization. It's very intuitive. Sometimes it's hard to explain. But with that, I think it's like once you know, you know. And so along this path, there have just been some points where we just knew. Yeah. And like it's almost hard to explain it any other way than that. 
I, I love that though, because I've, I've felt that where when you see it or when you, you smell it or whatever it is, like you get it, that's, it's just already done almost at that point. Yeah. There's so many parts of it that go in so many directions. Sarah helped us put all the things we do into four buckets. We call them buckets of work, which really helped manage kind of thinking about what we do, what we need. It helped manage it. It helped it make more sense probably. Um, and so that that was really helpful. And when you're ready, we can talk about those four things, but um, you know, at the bottom of this, we just want to help rural communities be the best they can be at being themselves and the people in them. And that can take lots of different shapes. And when I started 30 years ago with my dad, the way we learned about what we wanted to do was by being on the road, in the towns, talking to the people, seeing the people. Mm -hmm. And and so part of the grant um, was that Sarah and I would go on the road to every town in the state as a means of just, I don't want to say learning the ropes because she's been on the periphery of all this for so long, but to, do you feel like it's, you learn, see it differently mm -hmm. being in the town, seeing the people? Yeah. So um, when I worked for the Hutchinson News, the readership area was essentially the Southwest quadrant of the state. So and then when I worked in Topeka, I had always had more of a statewide focus. So I've been out and it's not like I've never gone to these towns and talked to people and asked them questions, but this is different. And um, it's different with a purpose um, that's not just gathering news or um, understanding what people think about water or agriculture or food or you know things like that like a topic it's um, a lot more open-ended and that makes it exciting and sometimes a little bit messy um, but it's been it's it's just been um, different in a really meaningful way um, to learn how to do this how many have you been to on your road trip so far well today's day 13 Oh boy. For town 32. <laughs> so just 590 something left. We have four years, we have four years to do it. So we're, you know, we've got about 590 left. But what we're doing is reframing. We want to ask questions to help reframe the future of rural communities. And you can't just talk to 18 towns. You have to, because every one of them is really uniquely different. Mm -hmm. And we want to know that and feel that and feel the pulse of each, each incorporated city in Kansas. And um, that's the only way to truly know how to move rural Kansas forward. Yeah. Oh, I just love what you guys do. I love your heart. It's so evident in what you're doing and even the words that you use like intuitive and messy and open-ended like there's just what looks like from the outside like pure love and support that like I'll give it to you however you need to receive it and like I don't even know what that is until I show up and see it and feel it for myself um yeah just like you don't have your own agenda you know, like you have an agenda of how can I love and support what's here? And I, I think that's like a really beautiful aspect that when it comes to making an impact, people can sometimes put the cart before the horse of like, this is specifically what I want to do. And it's like, kind of, yeah, like first feel what is and expose yourself to the fabric of what is and the inspiration, like we talked about in Marcy's episode last time, like 
it will kind of one thing leads to the next thing leads to the next thing like there's a thread that is almost already there you know that like we're just kind of on the scent of it Carly see you you're so good at this because you you really are intuitive you've picked up on some of the essentials of us um I think also what makes this road trip special is that we don't look for the top people in town. You know, we we just one day the we went into a post office in a small town and the clerk was busy, but three little kids were sitting on stools in front of the post office window, at the buy your stamps window, and we interviewed these kids and they were articulate. They clearly love their town. Oh. And we we don't make schedules because if people know we're coming, they tend to put on the dog and pony show a little bit mm-hmm. and just really want a, a variety. And what are some, who are some other people we've talked to that, I mean, it's not just the Chamber of Commerce. Um, we talked to a woman who is watering her flowers. Um, we uh, we go to a lot of post offices, libraries, libraries. Um, just uh, we've been so the vehicle, the Explorer Research Vehicle, Irv, um, does let people know that we're in town. It's wrapped. It's wrapped. It's got pictures of different scenes from Kansas and the guidebook and everything. So, um, and she's famous, um, like <laughs> hashtag Kansas famous. Uh, so we'll be eating lunch and people just walk in and say, Kansas a sampler. What do you want to know? Yeah. Um, so it's we get true. people coming to us as well. Uh, they stop us in the middle of the street sometimes. Literally the middle of the street. This is a true story. It's happened more than once. <laughs> And then but what we do they say like what's so urgent that they have to stop you in the middle of the street like they're here yeah you you came to our town we want to tell you about it. one woman found us in the middle of the street and said my restaurant isn't open yet but I'm going to show it to you come on in you know things like things like that they just really love that we came to them and we are there to ask them questions and they and we try to find someone in every town, no matter how small. And it's a hunt. Sometimes the co-op, the grain elevator co-op is is the place we find them. Um, but the search is on. We want to get a good feel. If you're incorporated, we want to know you. And, you know, we we want to see things like, do you have young people involved? And, you know, we don't want to make them feel bad if they don't. We we just want to know at how does that register in your town about involving under 40s, under 35s? We want to know that. We want to know if they like themselves as a community. Mm-hmm. Um, we want to know what they need. Like this one city clerk was new. She's 70. And she didn't, what? Because she had some real like organizational things that were part of the job that just weren't in her background and didn't really know where to go to get them. Mm-hmm. And we could connect her. Yeah. Um, we check on grocery stores, you know, how are you doing? We want to find out how they're doing. We ask about volunteer fire departments. We... We ask, what do you want for the future of your town? I mean, that's kind of the main, you know, that's that's the main thing. And the answers are almost always surprising. I was going to say, like, what what do they say? Well, a couple of weeks ago, it was, what do you want for the, you know, what would help the future of your town? A swimming pool. A town with 300 people, no, no grocery store, no businesses, a stop and go on the highway. So no real cafe. And the answer was a swimming pool. Because what what that told us was that they feel like community without any stores, without anything. Yeah. They essentially have what they need to feel 
good about their daily lives. They feel like they're part of something, mm. which means for them, they're used to not having stores because it's been that way for a while. Their school is gone for about 10 years. They have evolved into finding a way to feel connected to each other. And they thought a swimming pool without, you know, being analytical, like we want to stay connected with our kids. And so therefore a swimming pool, it was just, it just came out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it, it's interesting because when you ask what they want or, you know, need for the future of their town, the things that they don't say to your point are kind of like almost just as interesting as the things that they do say. I mean, exactly. learning yeah. a lot about they're not missing these things and just the whole concept of rural, like when you're used to being in the small place, like you don't really miss all the things that you don't have access to. You don't really think about it unless you're exposed to that stuff regularly. And a lot of these places, they're just not, they're happy with what they have for the most part. It sounds like, I mean, if that's the biggest thing that they could use, it, that's a pretty cool compliment for their town. Well, and, and the other thing that tells us two things, one, um, if a town is well taken care of, that's an indicator maybe that they like themselves. Mm. Would you say? Oh, yes. And you can feel it. Yeah. Again, it's back to this feeling thing. You can feel it when you go into town. You can feel if they like themselves or not. You sort of can. Yeah. The other thing, though, know, is you might drive down a town, a uh, main street, a downtown that looks like it's seen its better days. And so we find people and ask the question, what do we not know? What can we not see? What can we not see? You know, like we see that your town, we don't say this. Well, there's not a lot going on yeah. that we can see. That we can so, see. Tell us what we there, aren't seeing. Yeah. Yeah. And and what and did they say to that? Amazing. Yeah. What are some examples of things you've heard to that question? They tell us about this guy as this dream that he wants to do for this town. Mm -hmm. So it's it's or this woman is fixing up this bu building to have this business. And you can't see that because it's behind, you, you can't see it. Or, you know, we've got this fundraiser going for this kid or, you know, it's, it's things you can't. There's see. a group of us starting to meet, um, you know, just yeah. things. Yeah. And a lot of it, um, I think it's easy for both of us, but something to keep in mind is that you just need to be open like it's this is possible because we're open we're open to things not being a certain way we're open to things changing we're open to like remembering going to a town 10 20 30 years ago and seeing how it's evolved and I think that's almost one of the most important things when we do talk about the future um because this is a point in time mm -hmm. we're kept what we're capturing right now is a point in time so it, I wouldn't say it takes work, but part of the work is just remaining open. Mm -hmm. And Carly, you talked earlier about lived experience. Like, yes, <laughs> it is. Um, we are, people are sharing with us their lived experiences and then we, we take them and we um, try to honor them yeah, and support them if they need it. And um uh, or turn over an issue to someone who can help, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, like we can't help every issue, but we know people. Sure. But I think that's one of the biggest keys is just to be open and not go into any town with a set of expectations. Even if we have background knowledge, it's always helpful. But the question is what's going on today? What's important in the future? If that means five, 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. It's really wonderful to not have to uh, come in as advisors. And they love that too. Everyone likes to be asked questions. How are you doing? You know what? I see this. Tell me about that. And and one more thing that 
one of the biggest issues is loneliness and social isolation, especially in these small towns. And sometimes the biggest champion of breaking that cycle is the post office clerk. Yeah. We've done that time and time again. <laughs> there might not be any other regular meeting site. So they come in to see the post office clerk. And for the most part, we're pretty impressed with those people behind the counter because they love their job because they want, they care about the people. They'll laugh at your jokes. They'll share the news that should be shared of importance. And keep the stuff that shouldn't be shared. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Librarians we found are also the town therapist. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we don't have an agenda, some for some reason they trust us and they tell us all sorts of things that that seem pretty personal. Yeah. I think that's where our 30 years comes in. We've gained their trust over time. Yeah. And so when we talk about the future, they're they're open too. They're open too. They're willing to share. Yeah. I love that. And I mean, there's so much out there in the leadership space, especially like the team building space about trust building. And I think you just illuminated like really how easy it is. Like if you don't have an agenda that you're trying to push on somebody else, they will mostly trust you. Mm -hmm. Like if you're not pushing your own, I mean, kind of what I would call like your own ego's agenda, like the reasons that you think are important. Like, and I wonder, is that what you mean about being open? I know you mentioned like not having expectations, like how yeah how what is what is maybe not being open look like what's an example of do you know what I mean oh yeah. like we're coming in and we're going to tell you how to fix this place like being advisors yep. or being directors being directive about it so we wear t-shirts and shorts you know we don't we don't look we don't look intimidating yeah, yeah it's very much official sometimes yeah we're sure. just, we're just us. I, I think we, you know, you learn how to drop some lines that develop that trust right away. Like, um, maybe a name that you know, or, um, I see your post office is missing. Uh, that tornado really took a toll, mm. and so they know that you know that the reason they don't have some buildings left in town is because a tornado took them out. Yeah. And so then they trust you because, oh, you know that that happened to us. Yeah. It's also, I think, really important, like Marcy said, that we're going to them. This isn't a meeting in Topeka that everyone's expected to attend. This isn't a meeting in Wichita that everyone's expected to attend. This is we are going to them on purpose yeah because we we care we care about them we care about their towns we care about their counties we care about getting the most the best picture we can of rural kansas and i think that helps it it's such a huge statement when you're willing to take time out of your life and be where they are like that I was teaching in a course about how to support rural grocers. And that was one of my number one pieces of advice was like, never invite them to a meeting at your office, go to their store and be in there. And if they're free to chat with you today, then chat with them. Mm -hmm. And if they're not come back again tomorrow and let them see you in their space. Because that again, I think is such a huge piece of building trust is that you're here for me. You're here where I am. You're trying to stand in my shoes as best you can. Like that alone communicates a lot about you and your openness to wanting to see it through their eyes. You know, you're not demanding that they come to you. And when we're not on the schedule, sometimes we miss people. Um, mm -hmm. We've gone back already, um, you know, 31 towns in. we've already gone back several places. Just there was someone we wanted to see. 
or as somebody who became uncovered mm -hmm. in our, you know, talking to people like, you know, everyone all of a sudden agrees, yes, you need to talk to this mm -hmm. one person and they're out today. Yeah. So, um, but we can do that too. Yeah. There's a couple of ways that we share like one thing from each town, either on our Facebook page or on an e-blast. And I think that also builds trust because we, we aren't exposing the warts of a town, you know, or, or either saying, I mean, it, I don't want people to think that we don't see the issues, the incredibly complex and big issues that exist. They do. Um, but I'm not sure you can work on those until you have the trust and kind of get to know towns at a foundational level. Yeah. It's easy to go in, you know, guns a blazing, like you should do this, you should do this. And then it's like, well, but why don't you have this in place? And, you know, we did have a post office until the tornado came through. Thanks for, you know, not knowing that, like the, the, I, well, that reminds me too of like, I think a common piece of being human is that we want to be seen and we want to be heard. But in order to be heard, one of the best things you can do is listen. If you want somebody to receive from you, the best thing you can do is first receive from them, listen to them. And in that reciprocation, they're much more open to hearing what you have to say. Kind of going back to, yeah, like don't, don't start with your own agenda. Like if you really want to be of service, start with the person standing in front of you. Like, what do you need? And why, why is that need hard to fulfill? You know, both pieces can be important. There have been times we talk to someone for 20 or 30 minutes and then they say, now, why are you here? Right. <laughs> You're just yeah. having fun talking to them. Jump in talking and yeah. then it's like, now, what are you doing? <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. That's such a good sign though. I think, you know. Uh clearly they were just enjoying getting to share. Like you said, like everybody likes being asked questions and getting to share a little bit from their side. And if they don't, that's fine too. Yeah. yeah do you ever meet any, any people who are a little prickly around the edges? Sure. Sure. Yeah. We even know they're, they're not going to divulge much. So we, we just, we kind of test things out before we say what we're doing so that if we, if they're not, if they don't have time, if they're not the right person, we can leave without having to extract what our, you know, by having in an awkward way. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, most people want to, most people are very willing. Yeah. And I think we learn when not to ask or who not to ask. So, and not to judge a whole town. Yeah, by somebody who's not into it or not having a good day or or yeah. whatever. It's not indicative of a town. Yeah. Yeah. So the the previous times that I went to every town in the state once with Wendy, Rao co-author of a guidebook, we it resulted in a guide Kansas guidebook. We're still unsure about what we'll do with all this information, but we do know we want to share it with organizations, state agencies that will treat it gently or use it to form projects or policy or, yeah, we don't really know for sure what we're doing with the It's info. messy. <laughs> I love it. I love we're it. only 30 towns in. We just, it'll come to us what to do with it. Absolutely. Maybe we'll be like you and do podcasts. We don't know. Who knows, right? Anything could happen. Anything. Yeah, we just don't know enough of the bulk of the result. Yeah. It's it's pretty neat. It's at individual towns. But as you go, the shape of Kansas starts to look different. Would you say, do you see that already? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. How so? Like what has, what's shifted? Either of you can chime in on that. You know, it's um, these currently what's striking me most is these towns of under a hundred and, and how they exist mm -hmm. because we've been concentrating on 
volunteer-led towns in general, which are usually under 1,500 population. But on this trip, we're starting to see the towns under 100 have their own set of specific issues. And there's about 100 of those towns that are under 100 population. And so I think we're seeing those towns differently, more specifically than previously. Um, but the shape of Kansas changes too with finding out how young people are utilized, valued in a town. That changes the shape of Kansas. Uh, housing, childcare, broadband, access to food, healthy food, yeah. health care. You know, so it's sort of like Kansas looks like this, and then we go to a bunch of towns, and then it, it just changes a little bit, and mm -hmm. it's morphing and maybe pulsating at different issue points. Yeah. Yeah. Anything? It's one thing to talk about, like, housing in rural areas. Um, we're keeping track of the places that we hear housing is an issue. Mm -hmm. People in Topeka know housing is an issue. We we like know this thing, mm -hmm. but and it's one thing to talk about it, and then it's another thing to go to a town where someone says there are five families right now that want to move back. Families bringing kids into the school district. Family mm -hmm. they want to come back mm -hmm. and they can't because they can't find a house that works for them. So when you start thinking about it it's more specifically like that, it's I mean it's hard to quantify really it's hard to you know sort of imagine but then as soon as you start to put a little bit of a shape to it you kind of get it yeah in a different way and if this is one town and there's already i don't know 10 towns like that mm -hmm. that we're hearing similar stories yeah it doesn't take long before that that can become something yeah what, what is it known? Everybody knows housing is an issue, but what they don't maybe see, feel here is that people want to move to these towns. And when you're in the town, you look at it and you go, that would really make a difference if five families could move back here. Exactly. Or um, three elderly people want to move out of their house, opening it up for a family, but they don't want to move. They want to stay there. But is there a place for them to live? So that's another angle of it that, again, you can kind of talk about, but until you're seeing it and someone's pointing down the street, literally yeah, house at a place, um, it's hard to, it's hard to feel it. Yeah. Housing is such like a game of musical chairs and in a town that small, you can really see it happening of like, until somebody gets up, you, there's no chair for you to sit in and like, they can't even get up out of their chair because there's no new chair for them to go sit in. Like it, it's just such a choke point for economic development. And then it's capacity because in these smallest of towns, no one knows they should go to the housing conference to learn how to write grants mm. to get a set of moderate income duplexes. Right. They don't, they're just not um, connected because sometimes the city clerk email changes per city clerk. And so it that town gets lost, totally lost in the shuffle. Yeah. We're trying to find at least one contact in every town so we can ask. So so they're not invisible. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. What has been I want to say like the most surprising, but in general, like what kind of caught you off guard by how it felt? I mean, it sounds like you do a lot of feeling in your line of work. Like what was something that you witnessed that just like really was like, wow, that's, I didn't expect that today. I know. Oh, I don't. So um, it was one of our really early towns. Everything's still early now, but um, the early, it, was, early. 
it was the town where we drove through and they're just, there were buildings, but they were not businesses. Um, they clearly had like a nice library, um, you know, a fire department, a school, um, you know, but hard to tell what was going on. And we went to the restaurant and um, just started talking to the people working there. And um, I had this, it was the first time it was like, okay, what's, you know, we asked the question, what's going on here that we can't see? And the answer was just so um, heartfelt. And it was, it was the town. It was like, oh, yeah, we're starting to get together. We have a lot of dreams. They use the word dreams. Um, we know some things, you know, we have a, a road project going on, but we need to get a sewer project going on. So we don't have to tear up our new road to get the new, you know, just, um, it was somebody who was plugged in, knew what was going on, but it was emotion. It was, um, you know, we're, we're trying, we want to do something. Uh, we don't always know what to do. and have this great conversation. They walk away. And I just looked at Marcy and she said, this is how you fall in love. And it is, it, it is because mm -hmm. it's like, it, it would have been easy for anybody to just be like, eh, you know, nothing going on here. Let's go. And this, the real story is just pure. And um, I don't know. There's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. I, I think the surprise for me is the continued willingness of people to share with us. Mm. And um, the like that town Sarah's talking about, it doesn't necessarily look like it's loved until you start hearing people talk and then you can, then you start seeing it differently. Yeah. And you, you start, but it's also, how many people are so invested in their communities in in different ways, but in like you'd think that people will be willing to volunteer or do things for big successes. But when the steps are so tiny, you know, you get tired, but there's so many people in these towns that just, I love my town. I'm from here. I'm just going to keep doing what I can. Mm. And it's only surprising because that's not the narrative that's out there. Sure. I mean, that's, yeah, like pop culture in general. I, one of the, one of the things that kind of irks me a little bit that's said in pop culture a lot these days is nobody wants to work anymore. And I personally, that's like one of the impetuses but I, I don't know, um, <laughs> for this podcast in general is like, look at all of these beautiful people doing such beautiful work in the world. Like you just couldn't ever convince me that nobody wants to work. I know them personally. I, we're talking right now. Um, and that they, these people exist everywhere. Like even in a town of a hundred people, like here's somebody that is tuned in, tapped in, wanting to make it better, wanting to raise the quality of life in that town for themselves and anybody else who lives there. Like who asked them to do that? Who, who pointed at them and said, here, you need to do this? Probably no one. And yet there they are. And it's like, I love the human spirit. I love when we fall in love. And then it's like, you just go and go and go and go and go because the effort itself is life-giving to a certain extent, like to see the the progress, even if it is teeny little steps, like that alone is satisfying and fuel to keep going for next time. Super glad you guys have had those experiences already, like right off the bat in your first little bit. I got to think for a four-year project, it's going to take a lot of fuel in the tank to make sure you make it, you know? And I'd be curious, how do you have any advice on how to structure a long-term undertaking like this so that you don't burn out so that you do make it to the end of what you're hoping to accomplish yeah, do you have any advice because <laughs> I would <laughs> to hear it <laughs> I guess it really does you know in a way the trip uh feeds you mm -hmm. it also you know it might just sound like oh you just drive around talk to people that's easy 
but um you know you, you got to find the wherewithal to talk to another person and go to yet one more place and do it in a way that brings out um some thoughts that are good to be shared but it's 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 you're gonna get tired <laughs> i mean but it feeds you too it really it really does it's uh you just need to take care of yourself i think one thing we're doing on the trip already is like going to fun places like this uh, the town of burdette they have a um, miniature golf course that's you can play for free in their community park and it's dedicated to Clyde Tombaugh, who's a native who discovered Pluto. So it's got all these space backs. So we stopped and played a game of miniature golf. And I, I think those, would you agree doing oh, yeah. those kind of things just helps add some lightness to the day? Yeah. It was a good thing we didn't keep score. Yeah. Why is that? We both would have lost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only losers. <laughs> well, what would you add to that, Sarah? <clears throat> uh, so, I mean, I think about it. Like sometimes I feel like I work for a 30-year-old startup because with this co-director thing that's new, mm -hmm. um, there's some change and trying to figure out what the future looks like, um, which is energizing and scary and that can take a lot out of a person, it turns out. Um, we have a good team, we have a good board. And I think it's even things like this where um, people are interested, um, wanna know, wanna be involved. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of energy in that. So trying to use the energy like productively mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. helping all of us go together towards this point that we don't know yet, but we know it's somewhere and we're going to go find it together. Um, that's very energizing. Yeah. I just want to add to that a little bit. We, uh, another person we hired, Simone Elder, she's going to focus on the power ups, the 21 to 39s who are rural by choice mm -hmm. and to have this team, Wendy and, um, Simone, Sarah, our, our part-time bookkeeper, Kim, I think that's, you know, we work, we're a team and there's some energy in a team concept. And, and, um, if we all bring out the best in each other, that, that helps keep you going. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Like all of those same things energize me on my path as far as being aligned with the work is a big part of it. The work itself feeding you is a huge part of it, but also like the people I'm working with, the, the other people who are interested and excited about the work that we're doing, like all of that kind of feels like borrowing energy in those moments when maybe, yeah, like it's gas tanks running a little bit empty, but it sounds like you guys also are doing like how did you say that? That you're picking the communities or the counties at random and like a certain, right. what's that? It's random. All right. Yeah. Just we draw did. them out of a hat or what's that look like? It's just sort of like, uh, I've heard about someone in this County doing good things. Let's go see them. And then we do the whole County. Sure. Yeah. Or it's sort of just one of us is a planner. <laughs> Which, which one <laughs> she's a planner and I'm a little more uh random or just you know it feels like we should go southeast today <laughs> or this week and so but we're a good balance for, we compliment we we do we complement each other really well and, I was going to ask you like as far as the co-directorship model yeah, what are the ways where you feel like the co-directorship is creating kind of a, what would it be, like a more robust version of what you're capable of? Because, you know, Sarah brings this and Marcy brings this and like, no one is the whole thing, but we each bring our part. Like, what would you say? How does your unique co-directorship kind of shake out as far as what each person brings to the table?
it, it just is, you know, I, I mean, I wouldn't say we planned very well, like go through her traits and my traits and say, let's bring these out and these out and leave that over there. It's, it's not like putting the puzzle together beforehand, but as we go and need a, oh, we need a puzzle piece right there. It just sort of develops who has the strengths to be that puzzle piece. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'll use the word lucky again. I just feel like we're really, we've, um, it, it's not really luck. It's that we've known each other over years mm -hmm. and in a strategic planned way, we, this co-directorship was developed because we thought it could work. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure we even know what the future holds, but I'm pretty darn confident that between us, we can make it happen with Simone, with Wendy, with Kim. It's sort of just how the team operates. Mm -hmm. And then if, and then we've got this beautiful network. If we can't do it, we just bring in someone else that can add that part. Totally. Would Would you add anything to that, Sarah? I know you said like, you're the planner. She's a little more like free flowing, if we can call it that. Like, yeah. Any other dis distinctions? Um, I think that um, because we kind of worked together off and on, we already sort of knew like things that we were good at. So we, like she said, we didn't have to go back over them. Um, like we'll need to write a letter or plan a conference. One of us will start and the other will come in and then we'll just kind of go back and forth. And we don't have to, you know, start something, anything from scratch. It's like, who has the bandwidth to start? Who has the, you know, um, some of that has been developed over time and it's coming in really handy right now. Mm. Um, I think the thing I would say that's not necessarily a difference, but um, something that's shared is that there's a lot of trust and we talk about trust a lot. Um, we have, I personally, so no one asks her when she's retiring to ask me like hundred percent across the board because this is Kansas and everyone's so nice to each other. So um, like I have been getting a lot of advice about like make her set a retirement date. And my answer is no, because we'll know it. She'll know it. Yeah. And she'll tell me if people are thinking she's dead weight. Yeah. I mean, I really trust that someone will. But until then. Right. So, and uh, that's why we don't have an interim director, because that assumes there's a date when mm -hmm. that person either takes over or find they, you find a new one or, or whatever. Um, this is just what works for us. Mm-hmm. We suspect it could work for other people, but it couldn't happen, I don't think, if there wasn't a lot of trust. And communication, it sounds like. It sounds like mostly you're figuring it out on the fly. It's like moment to moment, who has capacity, who's, you know. And that's, I mean, that's kind of the plan. Like, what's the plan? We figure it out together. We figure it out as we go. And um, what do I say? Plan to be organic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which I came up with to make myself feel better, but it really, I mean, it's really true. That's, that's the plan. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I feel like I do things that are good. She then makes them great. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, because that holds a lot of potential for the future. Um, if we say that the 30 years have been really good, now this new team, Simone and Sarah come in, let's make it great. Let's do it together, but that's your challenge. Let's let's take it up, let's level it up. Let's take yeah. it up and because it, it just gets, the energy gets static if you're okay with how it's been. Mm -hmm. But if everybody, wants to make it better and nobody has an ego that's going to get crushed or you know if we just want the best for our rural communities then it all works pretty darn well oh, 
I feel like that's such great advice for any kind of transition of any organization, like in grocery specifically, we have a lot of grocery stores that are owned by baby boomers. And so as they're wanting to retire, we're having to transition all of these stores. And as we're doing research and, you know, what makes a, a successful transition, one of the pieces that can, you know, kind of obliterate the success in one fell swoop is when the outgoing owner wants it, wants the new owner to like, just do it their way just kind of like carry on the tradition. It ain't broke. So don't fix it kind of things. And then they get all bent out of shape when the new owner's like, Oh, and I want to do this. And I want to add this. And have you ever thought about, Oh, we could do it like this. And the outgoing owner's like, no, 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 no. no. And like, it just, it's, it's what you said. Like, it's not about your way or the other person's way. It's like, what's best for the community. What does the community need and how can each of us work together to serve the community that we're trying to serve? And that does take, you know, something a little bit higher up than our personal ego, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Mm. Well, you, you, you started it. <laughs> well said on your end first that, um, oh gosh. Um, yeah. Making that transition it sounds like you're, you know, within the first year, you have this four year process of going to all the places in the state. So we know we're going to be in this transition for at least a few years. And then after that, who, who knows, who knows what's possible? It could be anything. Yeah. The road work usually leads to what's next. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I would love to get to hear as you continue on your journey and your travels and the patterns continue to kind of reveal themselves. I would love to have another conversation at some point and get to hear about what's emerging and how the shape of Kansas continues to change. You know where to find us. Yeah, very good. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate you joining me, taking time out of all of this to come and share your story. Um, I've personally really enjoyed getting to learn a little bit more about KSF and getting to hear more about Sarah's background. You guys are such a gift for every community that you visit in Kansas. And I'm so grateful for, for you both doing this work. I thank you. We're thank really you. lucky <laughs> get to do it. Uh, thank you, Carly. And, and thanks for asking such good questions and letting us share and hear ourselves talk about what we do because we don't do that very often and I found it interesting did you yeah <laughs> cool thank you so much Marley. Oh, thank you <laughs>